Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Guitar Souls podcast. This is episode number 82. And yes, some of you probably noticed that I called the last episode episode 80, even though it obviously wasn't. And I knew that because we discussed it beforehand, but then I made it in the podcast and I'm like, why did I do that? Why did I? Because I'm an idiot. I am your idiot host, Mr. Levi Clay, and I am here with my good friend, Mr. Mike McLaughlin. How is it going, bud? Oh, am I not an idiot? Do I not get to be part of the club? No? Is that, is that how it goes? Well, you have to title True. yourself. So I'm an idiot. What are you? I am the Grand Buffoon. I quite like that. That's, That's quite good, isn't it? <laughs> it's almost royal and prestigious. Yeah. To answer your question, mate, I'm pretty good. Thank you. How are you? Exhausted. Very, very tired. Yes. Very tired. Yes. I've been working my pan in. It was my birthday. And uh, so I've, I've been in various states of inebriation over the last few days. I've taken some time off of doing YouTube videos, which is nice. Uh, not having to mm-hmm. stress about making a Brent Mason solo, but of course I'm going to have to go back to that soon, which is um, a terror, terrifying fear that's in the distance, like like looming, <laughs> an ever looming presence of you need to do some work soon, and I'm like, oh no, but uh, oh, yeah, 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 keep keep busy, very um, very good, enjoying the uh, the lockdown thing, apparently. <laughs> I, I don't know how you can enjoy lockdown, but uh, yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about with that looming, impending doom of work because I am working overtime tomorrow. Oh. Mm. But six till two, eight hours, double time. Yes. ha swing <laughs> your bra. Yeah, so, uh, so what gear will you money. be buying? <laughs> None, sadly. That's going towards Christmas bills for the wee man. Or oh. rather, money away for the wee man. Ah, that's just Christmas in general, isn't it? Such is, uh, such is life, yeah. I, could, I, I certainly don't grudge it. There's, there's been a bit of a shit year for money up and down with the, uh, the trials and tribulations I've been going through. But... Yeah. Uh, it's not going to stop me, and it's certainly not going to stop the wee man having a good Christmas. So he will be well looked after. I don't need anything. Nancy's asked for something that will sort out, and uh, I will be happy. It'll be good. Yeah, I, I think you just find that as you get older, like oh, I don't need anything. I don't need anything. There's there's very few things I I need. Buying me a birthday present for people is a fucking nightmare. Because what do you buy the man that that just buys everything he wants when he wants it? Like, there's nothing I I want. If I want things, I buy them. I get excited, but because I'm like uh, heading towards middle aged middle aged them. That's the thing. Uh, I get excited about pathetic things now. Things that I wouldn't buy myself, but I'd like to, like bedding <laughs> and towels. Like I'll, I'll be drying myself with a towel, and I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if this towel was like a really nice, fluffy, expensive towel, rather than this towel that feels like I'm drying myself with a Brillo pad. So that's these, these are the struggles I deal with in my life. <laughs> well, uh, all I can say is that I've started living in that kind of luxury, not because I went out and bought any new bedding or towels, but because I fixed our tumble dryer. Ooh. And we've now went from things that are dried over the doors slash radiators slash a drying uh, heated uh, cold source that we've got, but back into the tumble dryer and see coming out the shower and being in a nice, soft, fluffy towel. Mm. And then get into your bed and the sheets are all fluffy. Oh my fucking God. Exactly. So that was... That was a couple of months before I actually fixed it because I could not work out how the fuck I was supposed to get into this tumble dryer. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out I more or less had to disassemble the full thing <laughs> to get to a capacitor that was that size with two plugs. And once I got the <laughs> changed part, it was fucking take the nut off, put the nut on the new one and the wee holder, put two fucking clips in and rebuild the cunt. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> the level of effort is ridiculous. But for anyone watching Bye. and uh, anyone that is wondering what they can buy me for my birthday, other than things on my Amazon wish list, I would say don't buy me anything. Buy yourself a lovely Guitar Souls t shirt. T-shirt. There are links in the description. And if you don't want to buy a Guitar Souls t shirt, you could always. This show is brought to you by Ormsby Guitars. If you want to see something beautiful, head on over to Ormsby's Instagram page right now and see what they are all about. Ormsby Guitars have been at the cutting edge of guitar design innovation since Perry started the company way back in 2003. Since then, the brand has gone on to be one of the number one brands associated with Australia and modern guitar design. Aside from having one of the most ridiculous custom shops in the market today and a dedicated team that can essentially build you anything that your heart desires, more recently the brand has gained critical acclaim for their runs of custom order guitars manufactured in Korea, shipped to Australia, and then sent out through their distributor network. These guitars include incredible designs such as the Hype and the Goliath. If you head on over to Ormsby's website right now and check out the pre-order section, you can pre-order a Goliath Run 14 guitar now for under $1,200. That's an incredible price and an amazing amount of guitar for your money.
So as always, a massive thank you to our friends over at Ormsby Guitars. You guys absolutely fucking rock. Go and check their stuff out. Let them know we sent you. They're awesome. Whoop, yes. whoop, whoop. Uh, yes. I just got my guitars back. They've been set up too. Oh. oh, my guitars need setups so bad. So, so bad. They need fret work. Like, oh, mate, it's just getting ridiculous now to be honest. How well it's done? It's, I, like the frets on my on my Telecaster are shot to shit because I've been playing that thing. Like, it's my main guitar. I play it all the fucking time. Um, I know. It's just a little workhorse, and it doesn't have stainless steel frets on it or anything, so they're just they're just getting f- fucking worn down. Um, but it's other things like on a couple of my Mayanese guitars, um, I've got like uh, sharp sharp jaggy bits in the frets where like I've I've dinged the strings against the frets, but, but with the guitar falling over or something like that. I get and you, just get you. Little things that annoy me, and you're like, well, these yep. could be. And I guess I'm lucky because I've got lots of other guitars. Like I've been I <laughs> I I threatened slash promised that. Uh, after the last episode I was going to do a Brent Mason solo on the Ormsby which I did uh, that guitar's always ready to go you know it's always good frets ready to play but again at some point it will need work done to it and when that happens I'll just have to pick up another guitar and I think I'm getting to that strange stage now where every single guitar that I have I look at and I'm like yeah but there's that thing that needs fixed on it so I'll need to do something about that so rather than fixing them you'll buy another guitar I absolutely cannot <laughs> I'm so, no. Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, uh, as all of our listeners know, like, I've got the Brent Mason Telecaster on order. Uh, that's mm-hmm. a £2,000 guitar, right? I could really do with, with that money right now. So, like, every single day I'm considering cancelling that order. But Don't lie. I want the guitar. You may be considering it, but it won't happen. Um, well, if we could just get everybody that has even thought about you or I as a person on Earth to just buy some Guitar Souls merch, maybe, maybe we'll be all right. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Teespring certainly. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, uh, they would do all right. Yes, let's go. Should we talk Sorry. about some music today? We've got uh, a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Some uh, interesting things, some fun things, some lawsuits, obviously, because it's us and we only really talk about lawsuits. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why that happened, but you know, I, I hope people enjoy it. <laughs> I, th- I think we went against the idea of being entertaining and more into the idea of pretending that we're intelligent. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's just like. Welcome to the Postulators Podcast, where we just pretend we know everything. <laughs> so that's yeah. how it feels at times. Oh, by the way, total as a besides, before we crack on, I discovered a very cheap root beer. It's called Ben Shaw's Root Beer from Asda. It's £2.05 pence for six cans, and it blows A&W out of the water. Hmm. It's fucking delicious. Well, I and our listeners will be very pleased to hear this, uh, have completely stopped drinking fizzy drinks. So For now for now but i'm quite i mean you can all see me drinking from this mcdonald's cup i had to get a milkshake because i'm painfully hung over today um but yeah fizzy drinks they're they're off the menu for as long as you mean you're switching between two different fizzy drinks i noticed there <laughs> so yeah the carbonated king yeah sorry it, right let's talk let's about this show let's talk about, let's talk about your birthday no no let's talk oh, about okay. your birthday first right do it and well you already know what i got you for your birthday System of Down have released two new songs just for you. See, I was going to go with this as the main story for the show, but we can do the main story first. And this is obviously the main story because it's a great story. Go on, tell us more. Of course. Okay. So System of a Down have released two new songs, the first of their music in 15 years. Two tracks, one called Protect the Land, and the other one called Genocidal Humanoids. Um, I'll just read some of the stuff we got for the Rolling Stone article. I've listened to the songs separately. Sure. Um, didn't give them too much I listen, but I, because I wanted to give them a proper listen and sit and really take them in. And I was in the car, and it was like, mm, I'm going to be able to hear them, but it won't be great. Um, anyway, so this comes for the Rolling Stone. This was only yesterday these songs were released. So with Azerbaijan waging war against the homeland of the band members' ancestors, the group decided to strike back and use its music to raise funds for its countrymen. It took a war for System of a Down to record new music. After seeing the country of Azerbaijan start a conflict with Armenia in September, the musicians, who are all of Armenian descent, rushed into the studio to record two new songs, Protect the Land and the Genocidal Humanoids, to draw attention to the crisis in their ancestral homeland. The band will donate proceeds from the songs, which come out on Friday, to aid Armenians and its soliciting fans to donate to the Armenia Fund, which provides humanitarian relief to the region. Both songs are available on the group's Bandcamp page. Fifteen fucking years waiting. Yeah. And all it took was, Serge, it's Levi's birthday, go and sort it. Go on. <laughs> stop, stop being a dick. Yeah. Just, 
Just, oh, I, just pretend Shavo's not said that and go on with it. I don't even think it's that. I think it's... Obviously, they listen to the podcast. Of course, they listen to the of podcast. Course. And they're clearly very upset that we refused to talk about them until they released new music. And, you know, we said it, and then a month later, they're like, okay, come on, boys, let's sort it out. Um, what did you think of the tracks? Um, as I say, I only gave them a quick listen. Uh, but my first impression, and I'm probably going to get shot for this, wasn't that fun? A uh, fun, sorry, on Protect the Land. Sure. It was definitely more like a Scars of Broadway song because it was very, That's very dark and heavy. It, it's like he wrote it. That is a him song. But Genesis Humanoids had actual system of a down feel, and there's a bit with blast beats, and I was like, "Fucking yes!" It's like, yeah, it's like they want that chaos in their music. It's a wee sure. bit like um, for anybody that listens or has listened to Biffy Clyro, they went for having that kind of math core sound that made them sound like them. And then went more into the kind of pop melodies and structures over the last couple of albums. I felt it was a bit of a departure. Apparently, they're going back to that kind of right. craziness. And it's nice to see something doing, kind of yeah. showing off their trademark thing yeah. on a strong 15 years later for you to go right away. That's definitely System of Down. Yeah. It's class. Yeah. I, I mean, you've said almost everything that I had to say there. I was going to say Protect the Land sounds like a Scars on Broadway song. Uh, just with some some surge singing over it musically very simple uh the thing i guess i found really interesting about this is looking at people talking about this on social media i saw mm-hmm. some some kickback from political opponents of theirs um which is encouraged i think that's that's good like we, i mm-hmm. think the important thing with this is protect the land is probably the most political song they've ever released the video is very in your face and i just have to urge all of our listeners if you've gone and listened to this song or gone and watched the video, etc., and the thing you've walked away from that is anything other than I should go and look into this situation, then system aren't doing their job properly, if you know what I mean. Like the goal yeah. of this is to raise awareness, not to just go, system have got new music out, yay, system have got new music out. Uh go and look into the situation. It's not I mean, of course it's it's not a it's a dispute over over land, right? It's a dispute over who who should own land. Like legally speaking um the way things are going down over there right now it's all operating above board but people of old heritage are, are wanting to lay claim to land that they they used to own and this this sort of thing happens all over the world all the time uh but they yes. are they are concerned that another genocide might end up happening um it is worth looking into worth reading up on so yeah kind of back to my idea of like i, I don't like politics forced into my music um but this it's so heavy-handed and so, i'd even say ham-fisted actually uh they really want to put that message out about the people that are protecting their homeland um mm-hmm. yeah as long as people listen to it and do what the band would want you to do then awesome if not then <laughs> i can't I can't help but go huh it's almost like politics in music doesn't work i want this to work you know i want this to raise awareness and people to look into this situation mm-hmm well, politics and music does work. It doesn't work in terms of it changes how politics works, mm. but it can get people engaged. It yeah. just depends on the, the context. I totally get you. Um, for example, fucking your man for trapped. <laughs> Not it. the right way to do it. <laughs> Not the right way to do it. Anyway, so sorry for making that, which was supposed to be the main story in your flow as the very first one. Well, um, I'm going to throw more, one more thing on this. That It was kind of heartbreaking, heartbreaking in the uh, Protect the Land video. There's lots of footage of war. But there's also lots of footage of the band, just like shots of the band. Um, mm-hmm. oh, they're getting old. And I know I'm one to talk, but Darren's getting chubby. <laughs> he looks like a, a, a middle-aged man that survives on McDonald's. The irony isn't lost. <laughs> good, good. Um, pot and kettle. No, that yeah, chestnut. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've not watched the video, so that's I'm oh, going to okay. watch that later on. Okay. I'm putting that in the... Uh, as I say, I only heard the songs once over in the car uh, with Kieran, funnily enough. Right. Uh, him and I went to the dump i helped him take some stuff clearing his room out because he's in the at the at the moment renovating hopefully he'll turn right. his room into a better place for him to record and stuff yeah uh and we went into costco and went away run anyway totally unrelated <laughs> so <laughs> it, down. I, Good. well i have to say it needs the video like i think you'd see it as a boring scars on broadway song without seeing the video when you watch the video uh-huh. with it it's a it's a, a lot more of a, of a visual experience so, cool. The, I mean, I can remember the video, but the song's already left my mind. You know what I mean? Yes. So what I would say is, uh, I, I liked the even the guitar sound and stuff on the recordings was really good. Yeah. I know that's a total jumping back into it, but I again, it's one of those ones you can go. I know that's Darren's guitar. Yeah. Uh, so shall we move on to another band of that era? 
Slipknot. We'll just follow up on this lawsuit that we talked about previously, the Chris Fenn lawsuit. We, we've never spoke about lawsuits. Don't I know. Tell porky pies. <laughs> um of course the as always tends to happen in situations like this uh the lawsuit has been dropped uh there's no real way to know why that has happened could have been a settlement out of court uh or it could have just been that chris was advised that he's not going to get anywhere with this there's no real way to know do you want to read through this i'll go for it this was put on loudwire and this was published four days ago november the 3rd one time Slipknot percussionist Chris Fenn has dropped his lawsuit against the former bandmates according to emerging reports. On March 19, the masked metal band split with Fenn after he claimed he wasn't receiving proper compensation. The musician charged that Slipknot's Corey Taylor, Sean Clown Crahan, and a business manager, Robert Shore, diverted funds meant for the whole group to offshoot companies owned solely by them. The same month, Taylor called the lawsuit bullshit and said Slipknot were wrongfully accused of stealing. Now in a development picked up by Rockfeed and mirrored by the PRP, it looks like Fenn has withdrawn the lawsuit outright. The suit already suffered a blow late last year when ruling determined that Shore couldn't be named in the litigation, effectively ending that portion of the proceedings. But on October 29th, a document filed with the New York Supreme Court formally pulled back Fenn's entire complaint with prejudice, mm. meaning he won't seek to relitigate the same argument in court and without seeking any assistance with legal funds from Slipknot. It reads, in part, Plaintiff Christopher Fenn, by and through his unsigned counsel, and pursuant to NY, CPLR, whatever the fuck that's meant to be, hereby affirms that the above entitled action be and the same as hereby discontinued as against all defendants with prejudice and without cost to any party, and this notice may be filed with the clerk of the court without further notice. That felt like I was taking a stroke <laughs> trying to read that, because it's just so... Legal documents are always like that. It's just... I uh, just jargon. <clears throat> in September, reports stated the lawsuit had gone to mediation, leading many to assume the group intended to settle with Fenn. Indeed, the two parties may have agreed to a settlement, but neither has confirmed that nor disclosed any details about such an arrangement. Yeah. Definitely a settlement. That's... Definitely a settlement. Come on. <laughs> I, I think they've probably decided we'll settle this and we'll keep it away for the courts, drag everything back, and at least that way nobody's got any dirt in their name. Yeah, it's bad. I'd press. like to think. It'd be, um, be bad press for the band. It's, even yeah. if they win, it's going to cost them a fortune to defend it. Um, you know, like you've made a lot of money, and you've made a lot of money with this guy. Um, pay him off. <laughs> In the well, long run, it'll be better I, for you. So that'll yeah. be decent. As, uh, hopefully, that's put that to bed. Um, uh, uh, there was also something about uh, Chris Fenn being or. or uh, claiming that he was still technically an employee of the band, but it went to last year, I think it was, and he was talking about hopefully he would join, would someday rejoin the band, and I think basically we're like, no, no, yeah, that band's uh, a I, shell of its former self, isn't it? Like, <laughs> uh, musically and member wise, absolutely, yeah, it, 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 you know what, like, and that we all my friends for Wisha for years ago that I was hanging about with when Slipknot were quite popular. Um, not to say they're not popular now, but you know what I mean. Uh, seen the last, for the last ten years, we're talking about Slipknot. This single's great. This is really good. This is heavy as fuck. Mick Thompson's guitar's brilliant. Jim Root, blah blah blah. And then uh, Stone Sour came out and it was like, oh, Cody can sing like fuck as well. And it just became this horrible amalgamation of pop music with these heavy guitars, yeah. which I'm not opposed to, by the way. Sure. I like when it's well done. I just hated the fact that it just it, these two bands merged and it turned into. Corey Taylor's psychophantic fucking circus. Yeah. Yeah, totally lost interest in it. And of That's course, you know, oh. no more Joey Jordison, mm -hmm. no more uh, Paul Gray. And I oh, know. I mean, let's not pretend that Chris Fenn was an important, integral part of the band's sound, but he still, even if he provides minimal amounts of sound to their to their thing, like he's still part of that band. He's a visual part of that band. And that band's mm -hmm. a very visual thing, right? So for him not you to think... be there as well, like, come on. I know. Do you think you could maybe get Troy Grady to do a track, uh, sort of cracking the code on whether the new percussionist is as good as Chris Fenn and if they get the same tone hitting a beer keg with a baseball bat? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously changing where your plectrum sits or where you rest your hand on the bridge. I mean, these <laughs> things have a big change in your tonal. Yeah. Uh, the sonic resonance, I assume, would be the 
some way to explain it but surely it'd be the same for that because you're going to hit a different part different swing your <laughs> arms are going to be different tension you're holding a different place you've got different muscle mass different body shape yeah all these things are going to contribute to that sound so, okay <laughs> yeah fair point sorry um i went on an absolute dickhead <laughs> diatribe there sorry i'm going to move on to a, another story which is not actually hmm. strictly related to the music industry but it falls in line with uh things that impact the music industry and i think there's a, mm-hmm. a good lesson to be learned on this one i think you know what i'm talking about here uh mm-hmm. and just to point out that herman lee of course is back on twitch so there you go it's kind of a segue related to the the last um episode i saw this Come story on. and uh i thought this was great this was really really good so i'm not really into twitch i'm not really into watching people like do things live which i know is ridiculous because i do live things and expect people to be interested in them but yeah it's not my not my cup of tea but I hear that it's very popular. I hear that people love watching other people do things. Fine. Good. <clears throat> so here's the story. Pokimane becomes first streamer to cap Twitch donations. Would you like to read? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm probably going to butcher this poor lady's name. Um, this was the 2nd of November. This was uh, indicated. Uh, so, blah, 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 blah. Sorry. This was released on a website called ggrecon.com which I've never been on. Mm. So I'm going to say her name is Imani. Pokemon Anise is setting a trend by becoming the first Twitch streamer to ever put a cap on the amount viewers can donate. So for anyone that's unfamiliar how Twitch generally works, you have a channel like YouTube. Uh, you People can subscribe to the channel. They can gift subscriptions. They can yep. buy bits, which are like a currency that you can buy emojis and almost like super chat with YouTube. And then people can also give cash donations and stuff. Mm. So... It's a really good platform for people who are hoping to get a good relationship with their viewers and for there to be a kind of back and forth relationship and obviously for that to be where people can donate money and support the channel there, Um, obviously. So, as the gaming and streaming communities continue to grow hand in hand, the rise of full-time streamers slows no sign, or sorry, shows no sign of slowing down. From Tyler Ninja Blevis to Dr. Disrespect, Rachel Vikiri Hofstetter to Caitlin Amaranth Siragusa, Twitch has become known for its big names. Yes, Dr. Disrespect might have been given the boot, but it's important to remember the prominence the streaming service has had in all their lives, which is fair. Yep. Um, my understanding is that Dr. Disrespect, as an example, made a lot of headway on YouTube to start with, yep. moved to Twitch under an exclusive deal, and then whatever happened with their relationship happened, and they ended up back on YouTube. Yep. But it's not stopped them that's for sure uh when it comes to big streamers few come close to imani pokemon anise who sits pretty at the top of twitch's women with over 6.1 million followers on the platform she is by far the most subscribed female streamer with this in mind pokemon has now put her significant influence to the test and capped the amount you can donate to her the whole thing is part of anise's new mantra that people should be spending their money closer to home Posting on Twitter, Pokemon confirmed the new cap will be set at $5. She told her followers, Thank you for supporting me to the point where I consider anything more than that unnecessary. To anyone that was more generous, please support growing channels, charities, and treat yourselves. Beautiful. Yep. Beautiful. Like, fabulous. Because I know, I, I love that she's encouraging people to support other channels and help other content creators grow. Um I think if if you're listening to this podcast and you're completely unaware of how lucrative this Twitch thing can be, especially for someone that's doing the the type of content that she's doing, this like a five dollar tip. I don't get five dollar tips on my stream. Like this is the type of person that will get five hundred dollar tips yep. on her stream from people that just want want to be noticed, want to be want some you know interaction. Um, Clout. Yeah, and while of course you're free to spend your money however you want. Uh, I think if you're in that position where you earn a fucking fortune, an absolute fucking fortune from it already, that you can confidently say, I don't need more than more than $5. Uh, go and please go and give your money to someone else. Uh, mm-hmm. That's awesome. That takes it like balls this big <laughs> to to uh, make a, a change like that. And yeah, I, I just kind of, when I saw this, I was like, of course, this isn't really music related, but it is in the sense that a lot of musicians stream on tra- Twitch. Yes, they do. big on Twitch. Matt Heafy big on Twitch. Uh, that's they both consider it a second job. Now, of course, I'm not saying that they should put in some sort of donation cap like this. Um, but if they're earning X amount, it, just this idea of encouraging your viewers to go and check out other content and go and check out and support other people that are struggling to make a living is 
a nice I like it. It's a nice message. Uh, of course so. it is. You're right. There are a few other, um, maybe not so much Twitch streamers, um, or or that the content's on Twitch, but I've certainly seen a few videos on YouTube. I quite like watching Doctor Disrespect. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, depending on what he's streaming um, and who he's playing with. But you're right when you're talking about the amount of money that comes in is obscene. I don't know what he makes from any of his partnerships because he's obviously got his partnerships with like Game Fuel and I think Logitech and a couple other sponsors. Um, but his super chat, like obviously when you're on YouTube, you see it at the top. Yep. It comes up when people have made donations. It never stops. Yeah. And I'm not talking about like people are donating like a dollar or two. That consistently, hundred, fifty, yeah. Yeah. twenty, five hundred. Yeah. I saw one the other day. It was eleven hundred dollars. Yeah. Like for for one donation. I mean that's like almost a mind blowing amount of money to earn in a second. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or to not to earn, but to be gifted. Uh, not as earning, but you know what I mean. Um, it's mental. I, I can only imagine the amount of money these people can actually bring in. It is I mean, um, I have, astonishing. Uh-huh. It is astonishing. I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I have an insight to a couple of YouTubers that both sure. you and I know, and yep. the uh, the vast difference in their approaches to making money and uh, monetizing their content, and as such, the uh, the vast difference in the amounts that they're earning. Yeah. But the potentials for both of them are fucking scary, man. What? Scary. I've got a couple of numbers here for you. Uh, well, just, okay. just one, really, that will terrify you. Uh, talking about Dr. Disrespect. Uh, when mm-hmm. he was on Twitch, 22,000 subscribers. So he was bringing in over $100,000 a month just from subscriptions. That's not taking into account all the donations. So, uh, or brand deals or anything like that. So we're talking a lot of money, like absolutely ridiculous amounts of money. So, well, I mean, he turns up to like competitions and like uh, TwitchCon and stuff in a Lamborghini. Yeah, that that's part of his thing. Like yeah. talking about the Lambo. Sure. All these graphics are him. Have you have yeah. you seen any of his content? I haven't. No. Uh, uh, credit where credits due. It's not. You're not just necessarily watching him. Sure playing games and then like a wee window of him at the side when you're when you're in the gameplay that's what it's like but there's interludes and he's got a tremendous tremendous set like he's built all these cool images with a green screen set up with different cameras mm. and he's got like one of those wee um i don't know what you call them like the wee switchboard essentially where you can play this oh, voice the, the stream labs thing the... exactly right so what he'll do randomly is he'll play like an advert and the advert comes out with all the music and it's all yep. about subscribing to the channel and it's really informative and whatever else. And there'll be bits where it's him singing because mm. he, he releases music and stuff right. as well. And then like bits where like basically the, the shtick is that he's met, his profile of him is that he's like insanely rich and he's got all yeah. these super cool things. And there's bits where like he'll go off cameras and from sitting at his computer to walking about and he's obviously just in a room with a green screen yeah but the image behind him is fucking tremendous and it'll be him in like this mega stadium that's all branded as his stuff yeah uh, or like in in his lamborghini in the driver's seat and he looks up and he's like just over the door and he's talking while he's driving in the night and it's like totally neon mirage 80s yeah. it's cool as fuck man like i'm not i, I think he's uh his style is really cool and the fact that he's found his own brand his own way to entertain people yeah that isn't just necessarily relying on playing computer games is fucking tremendous yeah. and i can see why people do donate to him yeah because it's entertaining as fuck yeah i, I just have to say cool. if i was in his shoes and i was making if if this podcast got to a point where it was making a hundred thousand dollars a month hundred thousand dollars a month let's, let's say we're live streaming on twitch we're making a hundred thousand dollars a month you can bet your fucking bottom dollar that I'm not going to cap my Twitch donations at $5. I'm going to have a system set up whereby if you donate any money to me on my Twitch streams, it's automatically going to be donated. The 100% of it is just going to go somewhere else. Because if I'm making $100,000 a month on Twitch, I don't need any more money. <laughs> like, it's just well, greed from that point on. And I would much rather that it that it went to some someone else that's working their ass off to try and try and do something, try and achieve something. So. Well, that's it. I don't know how much of that Dr. Disrespect is taking home at the end of the day or for any other streamers what that scenario was, whether there's like another breakdown with that money needs to go somewhere else. But I get what you're saying. I think if it were the case, since we're talking absolute hypothetical dream situations, were we to make money on this podcast <laughs> and it to be a sustainable income for us, yeah. especially at that magnitude, I would spend a lot of time trying to find bands that are looking for a break and take them on tour and 
just like tour manage them and shit whatever like just i would love to be able to put that pay that forward and see people's faces like oh fuck i'm getting to go on tour for the first time and whatever else and blah 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 because yeah. thinking back what that would have meant to me when i was younger when i still had that incredible burn in my stomach the fire the energy for it the excitement yeah not to say i don't get excited anymore but i don't have the same inexperienced excitement you know what i mean yeah like it's like the the treading new ground was i know what it's like to go into and stuff now i still really enjoy it but it's different when you're doing it for the first time you get me yeah no so totally. i'd like i'd like to be able to foster that and help people that'd be really nice but that's look at us that's a dream couple of generous bastards I mean, I'm just being totally honest here. If if it actually happened, I would just have an insane amount of guitars <laughs> and some really fast cars as well. <laughs> yeah. The well, you know how this works, people, ladies and gentlemen. Mike and I are incredibly generous people if we earn enough money, and you can help us get there. Buy a t-shirt in the link in the description. <laughs> Pay it forward by paying us. <laughs> um, okay. Should we talk about Bring Me the Horizon? Yes. Now, that's one I assume you won't know too much about because we're talking about it and you don't really know the tracks. I don't, but I right. will play them while you're talking. I'll listen okay. to them. Right, that's cool. That's no bother. So I'll give a bit of a rundown then. So I'm not a big Bring Me Horizon fan, but I am a big Deftones fan, yep. right? Um, Deftones have had a couple of good albums out in the last 15 years. That Pretty much every album except Gore I got right into straight away, or Vore, I think it may be called. I'm not sure. Um, but Diamond Eyes came out and it blew me away, man. Steph Carpenter playing sure. this cool as fuck eight string, big heavy riffs, but usual death tones, new metal, big giant guitar sounds, incredible ambience, whatever else. Uh, Chino also had a couple of side projects out. He'd one out called Crosses at the same time, and it was more of his kind of electronic writing with electric guitars and stuff, which was good. Anyway, the follow up album to Diamond Eyes was Koi no Yokan. Yep. And the first track on that is called Swerve City. And the opening riff of that is very, very, very memorable. And it's a cool as fuck groove. So it's down, 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 which is cool. It goes into the chorus and whatever else. It's a really, really good song. Um, As I say, I'm not a big Bring Me the Horizon fan, but I've seen quite a few of my friends posting saying, this new EP is actually tremendous. Hmm. Like, really, really good music. A lot of different genres, a lot of different styles. Maybe struggle if you're not big in Ollie Sykes' vocal style, but give it a listen because it's pretty good. And I thought, you know what? Just the other day at work, like, fuck it, I'm going to give this a listen. Headphones in and put it on. And I really enjoyed it. But it's the first track, about halfway through, there's a breakdown that goes into a riff that sounds almost exactly like Swerve City. And this is the song called Dear Diary. So... As I said, I'm, this is going to be really badly done because I'm singing the riffs. So anyone that's not heard it's going to get a sure. feel for what I'm talking about. Not being able to explain it in any real theory sense. Other than the only real difference is the fact that Bring Me Horizon change the riff after, like say, the second, third, fourth bar. Whereas Deftones repeats for a bit. Mm. And it's got a slightly different feel because it's not as off the beat. It's not got as much a groove to it or a swing. Right. So again, so Deftones goes... This is a kind of more laid yep. back. And Bring Me the Horizons is the exactly the same notes, same tune and all sorts. goes... It's a bit more strict on the grid. Yeah. When I first heard it, I was like, that's been stolen for Swerve City. And I think the reason my brain done that is it's exactly the same key as well. Yeah, and it's the well, it's the it's the instrumentation, it's the overall arrangement, it's the way yes. the drums are playing, um, because I don't like the idea of someone trying to claim ownership of three quarter notes followed by three triple eighth notes. Da 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 da. da. Um, or, otherwise, we're going to have to give it to Star Wars. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think that. It's entirely possible, and um, I mean more than possible, that this is subconscious influence. I don't think for a second this was malicious. When no. you read this story further, they did have a similar experience with Evanescence That's on, right. the, on their previous album, which was settled out of court, um, yep. which implies Amy that Lee's, there was a lawsuit. Amy that on that EP as well. Yeah. Is she? There's a guest vocal point. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, it's actually quite good. I thought at first I was like, is that PJ Harvey? And then I had to go and look it up, and I was like, fuck, that's Amy Lee. <laughs> so they must have squashed the beef, which is cool. Yeah, uh, well, when when it says it was settled out of court, you would think that means that there was a lawsuit. There was never a lawsuit filed or anything like that. The management spoke 
and Bring Me the Horizon didn't argue. And they're like, cool, yeah, well, you can have writing credit on it, not a problem, type thing. So, um, which is good. That's a, it's the easy way to, sol- uh, to settle these things. Yeah. What I would say, just before you move on, you know, you're talking about not being like a malicious part of, or a, a, a conscious plagiarist yeah. kind of a theme. You're right. It was actually Kieran that had said to me about listening to Bring Me Horizon demo, uh, EP, sorry, or album. Because I was talking to him about recommendations, he gave me a few good ones, and I've got one for you actually that okay. I meant to mention earlier, um, that you'll probably like. I'll, I'll bring it back up later on, so the listeners can go and have a wee listen to. It. Sure. Um, but the conversation Kieran and I had, I, I mentioned about that riff because I'd read this article and I'd seen other people talking about it, and Kieran said, "I absolutely." But I think the problem is they just wear their influences too hard. Yeah. See, when you listen to this EP, he's right. You get into certain songs, and you're like you've you've like all but analyzed a band and taken what they make a song of yeah, yeah. and put a wee spin on it yourself which is cool it's obviously a wee homage to the the actual uh, influence of it yeah but i don't know i think that's it's a very very similar riff and i mean i don't mean that as in like similar if you wrote it down on paper i mean like when you hear it sure it, it definitely brings up the connotations of yeah. this is the same key the guitar sound quite similar yeah to me, at least, I'm like, mm, it's about too close to be coincidence. It's a really like interesting subject, I think, because in the jazz world, it's accepted that people quote each other's melodies, and it's done mm-hmm. in good spirit. It's done as a, a tip of the hat to your to mm-hmm. your heroes, to your influences. And no artist would ever, if if you put out a record and in the middle of your uh, in the middle of your solo, you quoted Coltrane's solo on Giant Steps or whatever. You know, Coltrane's mm-hmm. estate aren't going to be like, well. You know, I think you'll find that 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 belongs to us. Um, When I look at this, the song is two minutes. The Bring Me the Rise song is two minutes and 45 seconds. The riff in question doesn't come in until two minutes and 10. You know, so it's right right near the fucking end of the track. And to me, even if it was a deliberate, like, we're just going to play that uh, Deftones riff. um, To me, it's not the song. It's not what the song is. It's it would be like quoting a Thomas the Tank Engine melody in 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 it. Like I just if I I hope I guess what I'm getting out of this is I hope the Deftones don't mind. Well, they haven't said it in themselves, yeah. And I get the impression that Gino probably wouldn't be bothered because it's not the same riff. It's yeah. similar. It's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same scenario as Rob Flynn and Devin Townsend. If you remember, uh, we spoke about it before. Machine Head put out a song and the riff was a sen- It wasn't essentially. Yes. It was love. Yeah. It, there's, there's like it's the start of the song it's exactly the same riff yeah exactly the same riff this is different enough yeah that it, it could be a nod it could be coincidence yeah i think it probably isn't coincidence because it's so close but again i don't care it's it's no my beef it yeah. was just an interesting one sure. to talk about i think you're right yeah. and I, I don't want to say proofs in the pudding but i would certainly say i don't think the deftones are bothered because nothing's been said by them this is fans yeah of course uh, nothing has been said by them and more importantly it's got loads of people talking about swerve city so <laughs> which is a great song yeah and people great will, album. will have been back to listen to it so you know this this could do them good i would if i was in their shoes i'd take a lot more issue if the song was based on this riff but it's yeah. just a little riff that they use at the end of a song like yeah yeah fair, fair play doesn't fair. Does, certainly but, doesn't offend me Nah. I, I, when I first heard it, the first thing I thought was, that's fucking Swerve City. <laughs> but that's because I'm quite a big Deftones fan. Sure. Uh, that album and uh, Diamond Eyes, especially. Mm. The newest album's pretty good too. It's a bit of a weirder one, but it's good. Anyway, um, do you want me to give you this recommendation of the album I was going to tell you about? I'm just going to throw one now? additional, one, uh, additional oh, point sorry. on that. So yep. I, the thing I find really interesting is, it's I don't know if it's like a metal thing, and I'm going to go back to the jazz thing that I just mentioned, but like I think as a fan, when you hear that riff, on uh the bringing me the horizon track you you have options with the the second you hear it and i think it's so in the metal fans mind to hear something that sounds like something else and immediately be angry like immediately like fucking how dare they how dare they? Oh, they're, they're ripping off they're ripping off the death tones pieces of shit and if again if you just bring it back to the like the jazz mentality if i'm listening to a new record and they quote a melody from a, an old record that i love I don't, that wouldn't annoy me in the slightest. As a fan, I'd be like, that's cool. We're into the same things. So it's, I think it's totally a mindset thing. I'd be interested from our listeners to have a listen to these two tracks. And when you hear this, let's assume you're a big Deftones fan. When you hear this riff, would your initial reaction to be like pieces of shit? Or would you kind of look at it and go, oh, cool. We're both Deftones fans. 
And also, I'd like to point out that the riff sounds very like Mastodon as well. Uh, I probably not too far <laughs> off. I get what you mean by that. That kind of doomy, yeah, almost proggy sound. Sure. Well, I think another big driving factor of this exact or this specific scenario probably is there's a lot of people who don't like Bring Me the Horizon because they went very commercial. Yeah. And not that they abandoned their roots, but they took a different uh, yeah. approach. They were already quite a controversial band to be into as well anyway, just yeah. with them. And I don't know if you knew or remembered about this, but there was also a legal battle that happened, must have been about 15 years ago, where Ollie Sykes was accused of pissing on a girl on one of on the tour buses. Do you remember that? Yes. 2007, and yeah. apparently hitting her with a Jägermeister bottle or something. Yeah. Obviously, that was never proven in court. I don't know what happened with the actual lawsuit and whatever else, if there was a settlement or what happened, but I think that was a very divisive moment for them as a band right. in their career and where people stand in terms of not even separating the artists from the music, but just that I want to support this band or not. Yeah. Um, I was never really into them either way. So, I, I will say I really, really enjoyed that album. It was I wasn't too big on Ollie Sykes' vocals, but I get the impression he's the kind of vocalist and front man that you grow to appreciate. Kind of, he's either marmite or it'll take a bit of time. Yeah. Um, not my couple, but it was interesting. So give it a listen. Okay, it's not terrible. Ready for another segue? Yes. So I think it's fair to say that when it comes to Bring Me the Horizon, especially in the case of their singer, everyone thinks he's a bit of a fanny. Speaking of people who we think are a bit of a fanny, uh, Al Moomin of The Heart Machine. And it almost feels bad talking about this because this podcast will get more views than his video that we're going to talk about here. Um, but yeah, I want to encourage wrong. people to... I know. I, I want to encourage people to go and check this out because it's a staggering, egomaniacal video. It's staggeringly misinformed or, or misleading i should say that it's staggeringly uh he implies a lot but never states anything there's okay, okay basic rundown so al moomin of the band the heart machine who we have talked about a fair few times on the on the podcast because of his, yeah yeah because of his shitty behavior uh he has taken a bunch of money from people for an album that album obviously still isn't out because of nope. course it isn't uh, he has just uploaded a video to YouTube on his channel, The Harp Machine, that's Harp with two A's, called Final Boss. And in that video, he talks about him overcoming his personal struggles and how he turned to fitness, uh, you know, both body and mind. Mm -hmm. that he's working out in the gym, etc. And he wants to share this love and this passion and this thing that's completely changed his life to people. So he's starting up a business as a online fitness coach. So, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I was just going to interject before you went on that last line there and just provide the context that you and I, as everyone who listens to us regularly know, we are all for supporting each other in terms of if you're having a bad time mentally or struggling or have a blip or it's the worst you've ever felt or you're going through something you don't understand, we would love to be there and help you. We'd love to offer some sort of guidance if, if it's just a, a chat on facebook or instagram or whatever like it's totally there and i'm not the type to cut people down for overcoming adversity sure. i know you're not either no sure but that's not the point here which is i, I feel like i need to distinguish which is a shame fair point because it yep. shouldn't be hmm. we should be able to talk about this and no one to assume that this is us shitting on them for doing well for themselves because that's again not the problem we often talk about musicians who do music business and have side hustles Misha Mansour would absolutely yeah. hold in fairly high regard. Yeah, Nolly, these people have made great careers for themselves, not only doing their music but continuing to make money in different ways, which is really good, right? So that's not the problem here, in my mind. Uh, sure. Maybe you'll share the same sentiment. Yeah. The big problem I have is Al disappeared with money for this album that he said was done. The album's not here. He makes shit excuses on this video and then talks about this overcoming adversity, as you say, in starting this online business. Where'd you get the money to start that business, Al? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of clips in the video of him singing for the new album. They are fucking atrocious. Uh, really? The thing that kind of bugged me was, <clears throat> really, he's he's got this message of, you know, guys, if you're having a hard time, and it's a good message, if you're having a hard time, exercise is a great way of dealing with that, and, you know, working on the mind is a great way of dealing with that, and I've learned all of these things now because I've fell in love with being in the gym and I've read all these books, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, and it's fixed me. It's changed my life. It's changed everything about who I am. And I did all of these things for no expense. You know, I just did the exercises. I just read the books. But if you pay me money, I'll tell you how to do it too. And that's the point where I'm like, hang on a minute. At the very core of this, are you not deliberately trying to pitch this to people that need help? You're pitching yourself here to people that you feel might be having mental struggles and you want to help them get out of that if they give you some money. I'm just not a fan. I'm just absolutely not a fan of that as an approach. Like, you did all this for free, man. Like, if you really want to help people, fucking help people. You don't want to help people. You want to do the same thing you've always fucking done, which is put money in your own fucking pocket. You disgusting little wretch. Have you looked at the links? I have, yeah. Yeah. The Heart Machines website is where he's selling this, so it's not a separate entity. And... £63 gets you the Get Hench Core, which is a customised training plan, customised nutrition plan, and 24-7 email support. My core training and nutrition plan for you to implement towards achieving your fitness goals. Everything will be tailored to your needs, preferences, and tastes, with any questions support provided through emails any time of the week, within 40 hours. Including sets, reps, rest times, intensity variations, etc. All the details will be mapped out for you to carry out. If you follow my plans, you will transform your body valid for 30 days so if you buy that and don't redeem within 30 days i'll move and keeps your 63 pounds and you don't get anything yeah (laughs) um get um, hench pro is 93 pounds yeah it's the same thing but with 15 minute video chat i know get the fuck just just get the fuck man like i don't want to shit on this guy constantly but he never does anything that actually seems like it's in any way shape or form about anyone else in any way shape or form yeah Everything is me. How can I benefit me? Yeah. Which yeah. undermines the language and the message he puts in the video, but not the actual context of the video, if you get me. Yeah. Anyway. Um, there's. I'm glad he's not deleting comments on the YouTube video because some, some dude on the, it was the first comment posted actually, s- said, it's all great, but you did a deadlift wrong in your Instagram post. How can you coach anyone? Uh that's, I guess that's the problem with fitness, right? You can't just, you, you you can't just like pretend to be an expert. What he's done, I can tell you what he's done because you can see him training in Pure Gym, okay? So he he goes to Pure Gym. He's just mm-hmm. done their training to be one of their one of their personal trainers, you know. And now he's just probably now he's just going. Well, I'm a qualified personal trainer. Well, you know, go fuck yourself, mate. Uh, and actually See, the other reason i take issue with this is when you watch it he does he just throws a lot of shade at sumerian records owner and says how yes. that guy fucked him over and completely ruined his life and everything and it's like why because he expected you to hold out your end of a deal and you couldn't do that because you were a useless person with substance abuse problems like fuck off that's not his problem man's running a fucking business and you're sitting here trying to run him down, saying that he doesn't know what he's doing, that he ruined your life. I think Sumerian Records have got quite a good track record of actually helping quite a lot of bands on your scene out. If you can get an opportunity like that and piss it down the fucking pan, just like you're pissing all of this, all these uh, crowdfund money down the pan, and you're going to piss this coaching thing down the pan, that again, mate, that's absolutely on you. And you've proved that this is absolutely on you by the fact that you pointed out that you're fucking, you know, horribly depressed and you've had to fix your life because you're a broken person and you needed to fix yourself. You know, th- this guy didn't break you to the point you needed to fix yourself. You didn't need to recover. You needed to fix yourself. You needed to change the shitty things about you. And you still don't see that you've not changed the shitty things about you. Aye. It definitely seems to me like uh, he's got the wrong lens on when he's looking at things. His perspectives are a little skewed. Um, I, I must laugh at one of the comments, though. Can't wait to buy albums three, four, and five, too. You haven't even got album fucking whatever one was meant to come out was it the yeah. second the third yeah. who knows fucking mystery why you want yeah. to support somebody that clearly can't deliver and what they're yeah. pretending they're going to give you sure frightens me and I, I hope i really 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 fucking hope we're both wrong and it comes out next week and all the money went into that and he does well for the the uh the health and safety, uh, fitness stuff yeah and he starts off on that for free and then everything goes well but i don't see it happening well there's another comment he makes in there where he, he's not necessarily throwing shade but it's i just think it's a it's a demonstration of the fragile need to protect one's own ego, which he says, he says, I know a lot of people in our business make money selling pedals and plugins and guitars and stuff like that. And that's not really for me. 
And it's like absolute fucking horseshit, mate. Not, if you not, were in a position where a company wanted to sell a harp machine pedal, you would be fucking all over it. All it over it like home. flies on shit. It's not for you because nobody's interested in putting out a product with you. Correct. It's not for him because all the content that he released when he had the Strandberg that made people look, whoa, that Strandberg's fucking cool, was so heavily edited that everybody knew it because it was just a guitar pro fucking yeah. file with him playing over the top of it, unless yeah. his pickups doing MIDI from magnets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there was also a video of him at like a... some sort of conference, or not a conference, like a masterclass or whatever. Um a seminar of some kind that was him playing heart machine stuff and i believe it was like in china or something and he does pretty well but there's loads of bits where he fucks up and you yeah. can tell he's really angry about the fact that he can't play these things as fluent as he's shown before yeah um like, like it's bad hmm. and everybody has a fuck up again not saying haha like this guy did badly but you and i and hopefully the listeners understand there's a different context between somebody putting themselves out there and making a wee mistake and just getting on with it or somebody and sorry someone else who presents themselves as something they aren't and yeah. can't do which is why i think you had the big issue when you were calling out lucas man etc yeah. because what you are watching him do with his hands isn't the audio that you can hear mm. it's it, it's not fraud but it's certainly deceptive well i think in um in al's case he's actually his defense is totally valid the reason I take issue with guys that do that online is because they're usually trying to sell you a lesson package. They're trying to misrepresent what they're capable of so they can in turn misrepresent what they're able to teach you to do so they can harvest money out of your wallet and then never be able to deliver the thing that you thought they could. Well, Al's thankfully not trying to pitch guitar lessons because he's, he's not up there. He's just not... He's a creative composer. I'll give him that. He's a really creative composer. Good on you, mate. There is no doubt it's very very fair to say he can play mm. he, he can write sorry yeah and he can probably play the majority play, of his riffs. Yeah, he plays pretty well but but you know, it that doesn't ego do that need for everyone to think that you're the greatest thing ever was this man's downfall so yeah get hench pro get in the fucking bin al moomin get in the fucking bin heart machine get in the bin the best heart machine related content that exists is your brother's heart machine parody video oh i Haraba. yeah free money an estonian <laughs> i was in fucking where was i was it lithuania hmm. maybe after a gig right played in lithuania went back to vilnius i think it was in lithuania uh, went back to the hostel which was actually a nightclub with a hostel above it so no sleep and I, when i say a nightclub i mean it was like a fucking really nice clearly quite expensive posh rave big dance club lights smoke machine booming bass and then upstairs was the rooms anyway there was a band there that we shared the stage with who were from estonia and one of the guys asked me oh hey do you know who k mac is and i was like that's my brother as seems to happen to me everywhere in the yeah, world yeah. i go and the guy's like no no way you, you you're telling lies man no chance and i showed him a picture of me and kieran and he, sh like, he was like freaking out <laughs> and he's like you know he's got that song vahara but that's estonian that means free money in my language and like getting dead excited <laughs> and i was like cool cool that's good I'm, I'm glad that kieran can overshadow me yet again <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, I say that as if like I've got any sort of jealousy or envy. Oh no, I you absolutely you should. Well. <laughs> no, not yeah. at all. I, I, I feel and I want to just. You're jealous of like, his talent. Everyone should be. He's horrendously yeah, I'm talented. <laughs> I'm jealous of his talent. I'm jealous of his ability. Jealous of his abilities. Sorry, but I certainly don't want to take that away from him or but think that. I'm sure he's jealous of your. He doesn't have how handsome you are. So. He's really handsome too. He just doesn't cut his hair or shave his beard. <laughs> Big man just needs a wee polish. He's just a. Uh, he's just a pile of red cheeks. Your brother. That is. That is him at any given time. That's the identity. I tried means. Yeah. When people say, is he re is Mike really related to Kieran? And I'm like, look at their fucking cheeks. Just look at their no. fucking cheeks. No, no. I'll I'll tell you what it, what it definitely is. They probably won't be able to see this because I'm going to go so close to the camera, but it's the eyelashes. Yeah, I mean, your camera's not that good, Res. <laughs> It's because it's on manual focus mode. Yeah. <laughs> if I zoomed right in, you would see, but genuinely, see, like, photos of me and Kieran, see if we do this. Same person. Like same eyes. Yeah. Same eyes. Anyway, sorry, we are we in a fucking diatribe again? Nah, good one. Uh, let's talk about Gibson and Adam Jones models. Not really <sighs> anything I'd be interested in. I'm not into Tool. I'm not into Adam Jones's playing. No. Um, 
I'm not into how expensive these fucking guitars are, but Gibson nope. did release a, a range of Adam Jones signature models. You can get the the 79 Les Paul Custom uh, vintage Silverburst, and they also do a vintage aged version, which is signed by Adam Jones. And I think uh, they vary in price. Well, I know the the uh, the signed ones are ten thousand dollars, just you know, nine thousand nine nine nine. Uh, I've not got the price to hand for the the other ones, but regardless, they're ridiculously overpriced because, of course, they are. They're a Gibson. <laughs> but thirteen of these guitars, thirteen of these guitars, valued at ninety five thousand dollars, stolen from a truck on its way to Sweetwater. That screams inside job. That just screams yeah. inside job. Um, wild. Yeah. Absolutely fucking wild. And it is a shame because these guitars were all pre-bought. So this is sweet where are losing money, sure, but also 13 customers that were really excited about something aren't getting their guitars anymore. I, I would say probably it's more so about the customers because I would be very shocked if Sweetwater don't have insurance. Sure. You know what I mean? They're going to get that money back. But you're right. The big focus here is People who are obviously mega tool fans, as it would have to be to pay ten thousand dollars for a Les Paul, a Gibson Les Paul, hmm. um, especially a new one. Um, yeah, that's that's up to them. But I I do definitely feel sorry for those customers because the guitars aren't uncool. They are, and if you're a big tool fan, you know that Adam, not not even Adam, the rest, the, the band in general, they're quite funny about doing things their own way and trying to make a big impact yeah as both you and i noticed and witnessed when we watched the video oh yeah, came yeah. for the, the adam jones from yeah. gibson um it's like a six minute trip or something essentially and then oh it's, it's about a guitar they could have just showed the guitar yeah um which they kind of did but in a really convoluted way uh the thing anyway, i really liked about it is at the end of it it said all music composed by adam jones and i was like i don't know if that's anything to brag about mate I fear it's not, it's not great, <laughs> is it? <laughs> anyway, fucking $95,000 worth of guitars, and it's only 13 guitars. It's ah. crazy. It's crazy. So read but, us the story. All right, cool. I'll go for it. So this was November 5th, and it was at 3.01 p.m. on Fort Wayne's NBC. Fort Wayne, according to Sweetwater Sound officials, on October 30th, an estimated $95,000 worth of guitars were stolen from a truck on its way to the fort. Officials say a pallet of the new Gibson Adam Jones 1979 Les Paul Custom Silver Burst rolls off the tongue. Guitars were stolen from the truck at the Flying J Travel Centre in Whiteland, Indiana. The truck was en route to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where the headquarters of Sweetwater Sound sits. Somehow, out of a truck full of guitars, this one pallet was singled out and stolen at a truck stop, says Sweetwater Chief Supply Chain and Merchandising Officer Phil Rich. Inside job. I mean, that's basically what he said. Yeah. With a retail value of $95,000 in guitars, we feel this person, person slash persons, knew exactly what to look for and when. Officials say to keep a lookout for the following serial numbers of the 13 stolen guitars so they can be reported and they're all listed so that hopefully these don't get bought yep. uh, and leave the uh, poor customers who are not getting them back at the moment yep. uh, without them for a long time. So uh, our loyal customers have been waiting a long time to receive these guitars and will be devastated, says David Furr, SVP of the Sweetwater Experience. We hope Gibson's and Sweetwater's tight-knit community of guitarists will be able to help us recover the stolen items and that the people responsible for the theft are caught. If you have any information regarding this robbery, you are asked to contact Detective Kenny Polly of the Whiteland Police Department at K. Polly, which is K for Kilo, P for Papa, O for Oscar, L for Lima, L for Lima, E for Echo, Y for Yankee, Yankee sorry, at whitelandpd.us. And there's a telephone number there as well. Given that we are British, there is probably not much chance that many of the listeners will have any information on this. But yeah. if it's any use and you see nothing suspicious or you somehow found 13 Gibson Les Pauls behind a bin, which is where <laughs> it probably deserve to be, um, and thought that's about out of character, they're still in the box. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please yeah. let Kenny know. It's it's a wild one because clearly, whoever stole this knew exactly what they were stealing. Um, I just don't know if 100%. these guitars are. Yeah, they just. I just don't know if they're worth anything. You'd never be able to sell these guitars. They're too limited edition for for eyebrows to not be raised. Anytime one of these is available on the second hand market now, people are just going to check these serial numbers. You know, like these I... are going to be a fucking nightmare to sell. So you would need to have stolen these and pre-sold mm. them all privately. 
to someone, right. or you were just oh. planning on keeping thirteen of them. Like the other thing could be that they've stolen them and they have a hookup with another retail store that's going to sell them. Yeah, Fine. but then this, that other retail store is still going to be selling the guitars that have these fucking serial numbers on them. Eventually, well, someone is going to be sat with their with their Adam Jones Les Paul at home. They're going to look at the serial number on the back and go, "Oh, I remember fuck. something about these." Yeah, they're going to look into it, and everything's Aye. going to come unravelled. So, oh. I suppose the only other thing that might happen is they might be a bit fly and try and modify them to look as if they are original seventy nines. It's possible. I don't know how good you would need to be at modifying them or whatever anyway i'm totally speculating here as to how the fuck you would get away with having these guitars and getting them yeah they are such, as you put it they're too hot to handle yeah um pretty ridiculous and uh i nobody likes a guitar thief fuck you i'm gonna get connor how do you batter you with eight string <laughs> do you know what else nobody likes tell me spotify that's very true that's a great segue i, I don't mean, know I, what i love spotify for you. actually but well you know what you love the convenience of Spotify and yeah. the fact that it's got a great back catalogue. What you don't enjoy is their business practices. Funnily enough, Spotify will promote <laughs> artist songs to more users if they agree to lower royalty payments. Take less money and we will do our job. Pardon? Yes, we will, we will let the platform do its job better if you take less money for it. Take less so money you- and we will help you to get more listens so you earn the same amount of money. But Spotify make more money. Mm. Okay. As part of an upcoming trial, artists will be able to promote their songs on Spotify to more listeners, but they must agree to a lower a lower royalty rate. Which I think, before we even go any further into this story, which is on businessinsider.com for anyone yep. that's interested, how the fuck do you get lower than what Spotify currently pays artists? Yeah. Because it's literally fractions of a penny. Yeah. And I, I, I don't say literally in any silly figurative sense yeah. literally fractions of a penny <laughs> it's like point zero 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 four per listener pens per listener something yeah so anyway i'll read more artists can select tracks that spotify will favor when recommending new music to users but spotify won't guarantee that artist tracks will be added to playlists and say that it would only recommend music it thinks listeners want to hear the streaming giant announced the new scheme on monday and it will trial soon Artists will be able soon to promote their music to more users on Spotify, provided they take a pay cut on the platform the streaming giant announced Monday. Scumbag shit batter. Spotify currently recommends new music to listeners using personalised algorithms that are based on the artists and user listenings. Uh, sorry, uh, let me start that sentence again. Spotify currently recommends new music to listeners using personalised algorithms that are based on the artists a user listens to the time of day and the release dates of songs. This accounts for around 16 billion listens a month, Spotify says. Or, in money like money terms, financial, £35. <laughs> As part of a trial that starts soon, artists or labels can make specific tracks show up more often in these recommendations in exchange for loyal, ro- lower royalty payments, Spotify said. Have you come up here and spiked my fucking monster or something? <laughs> I'm turning to you. Can you read? In not asking for an upfront payment, Spotify said it was ensuring the service was open to smaller artists. Artists will be paid less for songs users surface in this way. When asked by The Verge, Spotify declined to say how much lower this promotional recording royalty rate was, but added that the idea is for artist teams to be able to earn a positive return on investment by using the tool. Right. How how can you pay them less and make more money? Shut the fuck up. Well, if, if, if you take a... I don't know, 10% cut to your royalties, but your listens go up by 40%, like, you you will make more. Um, but, but let's take a wee step back. These people have already paid for Spotify to put it on the platform. But you so, haven't paid for Spotify to promote you. Right. So what would the rate be for them to promote us versus what you're going to lose? Well, that we, we don't know, but, the, like, we can't... Exactly. Just, like... I'm not annoyed that Spotify don't promote my music. You know what I mean? Because I wouldn't expect them to. Um, and I don't want to be the one sit, sat here defending Spotify because I think this is a really, really fucking scummy thing to do. But I think mm-hmm. it should also be approached really objectively. Um, I think actually from a listener's perspective, listeners should have more issue with this than anything else. Because when you think about... Okay, so let's talk about YouTube. When you think about YouTube and my videos on YouTube, I get a lot of views because my views come up in recommended uh, videos for people. And they'll yes. see a thumbnail, see a title, and they'll go, oh, 
interesting. Let's see what that is. That's really the main way people discover my channel. Mm -hmm. I don't pay for that. I could pay for that. I could mm -hmm. pay an additional fee to YouTube, sponsor my videos, and they would show up in the top of recommended things for people. But mm -hmm. when that happens, it's going to tell you that this is promoted. And I think that's the thing that bugs me about this, that really bugs me about this. You do a search for something on Google, the top three or four posts are always going to be ads, but it will say promoted or adver advertisement underneath it, right? I think that disclosure is really fucking important because as a listener, if you use... I would never allow spotify to recommend me tracks i'm just not interested mm -hmm. when i listen to music mm -hmm. on spotify i know what i'm looking for i go and yep. listen to things i want to listen to but some people don't and that's absolutely fine but i would take massive massive issue if i would think for a second that suddenly music was being promoted to me not based on it being the best candidate for what i'm likely to listen to but because this person paid or is essentially paying this person is more profitable to spotify for them to mm -hmm. promote you to to me that's the biggest issue with this because it's like sure they're screwing over artists but spotify have always been screwing over artists to me well, this is a this is like a, a trust issue with the listener and i don't see why what? people aren't talking about that you're right i didn't even think about it in that context because certainly when it comes to youtube and people who are reviewers or whatever else they have to make it incredibly obvious they have to outright tell you if it's a paid promotion yeah. or if it's an advert yeah or if you are receiving some in return for your uh, opinion on it and whatever you're doing with it. so does that mean that spotify are going to have to do the same thing really why Surely when they are promoting these tracks they have to by law because it's not i don't think they would and i think it's based on the way that the the money is exchanging hands Money mm -hmm. isn't exchanging hands. You're not paying for a service, and they're very clear about that. You're not paying to be promoted. You're just a preferred artist, if you like. You know, we make more money off of you. You're a preferred artist, rather than that, you're not paying it's just for promotion. Off the top. Oh yeah, it's 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 turbo shitty. It just it really is. Um, I'm not going to be all doom and gloom about it. Like I can see this working for some people, but I think it's extremely fringe for the people that it's going to work for. Um, well, yeah, I, I think. The, there's another four paragraphs I just want to read really quickly and sure. I think they give context to what we're talking about sure. the company said in its press release that the users were its priority and the artists couldn't use the promotions to override the recommendation system we won't guarantee placement to labels or artists and we only ever recommend music we think listeners will want to hear it said the test will only apply to Spotify radio and autoplay formats which is where listeners want to discover new music it said it would later expand it to other personalised areas on its platform it added People have increasingly turned to Spotify and other streaming services during the pandemic as they look for ways to stay entertained at home. Spotify's number of monthly active users grew 29% year on year to 320 million in the quarter to September. That's mental. <laughs> it is. And I think it's very clever business, but also really shitty business of Spotify. Because what you brought up that, essentially it's a sponsorship but not a sponsorship or the, the vulnerability that it has to be manipulated although they're saying that it's been safeguarded as uh it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that works yeah and on the flip side like so i've been um i have music out on uh, available on spotify and it's all handled mm -hmm. by distrokid i'm very happy mm -hmm. with the service that distrokid provide they mm -hmm. recently have put together a huge list of contact information for for the all the biggest playlists on Spotify, and they will seek to get your music put on these big Spotify playlists, and they're not doing that and going, you know, ah, oh, well, we're doing a little bit more for you now, so we need to make a little bit more from you. They're doing it to make the service more fucking appealing. They're doing it to mm -hmm. make what they offer you more appealing. Spotify should, I think, not even be worrying about what they're pitching to artists. Spotify's business isn't like how can I convince the artist to give me more money? I think their business model should be how can we give the user the best possible fucking experience? And I just really hate this idea of like being recommended music, which is race to the bottom stuff, where it's someone that's just willing to make less money because they're just desperate to get that, that extra stream. What about the person yeah. that was going to be recommended to me there? Because surely these recommendations are tiered. Like you're never going to see every track that would be recommended for you. Let's say there's a thousand tracks that would be recommended to you based on the last five tracks that you listen to. And those top five, you might love. But they're just going to get shunted down because 300 people have now slid themselves up on this because they're promoted 
set, uh, technically promoted. Um, and Could Spotify be. would still be able to say, well, you know, we'd never recommend you songs that you don't actually want to listen to. It's always based on the data of things you're actually interested in. It's not about the fucking data. It's about the fact that you're uh, you're screwing over artists and you are treating your your users uh, as something that you can... As you're essentially selling your users to the artists. Like, again, acting like a fucking middleman. Like, provide a service, like an actual service here. Stop thinking about your bottom line. Your bottom line's enough. You make enough fucking money. No, no, they always make a loss. That's how yeah. all the staff are really, really well paid, except <laughs> the actual artists, Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Aye, right, so, uh, yet again, fuck Spotify. Yeah. And Daniel Eck, whatever the fuck his name is. I'm going to say that, but I have my Spotify open as, we, as we're talking, so... I have... I, I was using Google Play Music, uh-huh. but they're shutting the service down. Are they? And, uh, I kept, yeah. So I kept getting these offers to transfer it to the YouTube Music app. And I was like, okay. And I really thought, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. But it got to the point where I was like, I'm going to have to, because it's either that or I go to Spotify. And I'm, it's not that I'm not... I don't want to do Spotify, but it annoys me how many bad stories there are. And I feel like if I were paying for Spotify, I would feel like a real hypocrite. Which is, it's fine. Like, it, that's just me personally. I don't judge MD else for using it because sure. it's a great, and like Nancy uses it, it's a great platform. It's got lots of content. The actual player's pretty reliable. Um, All these things are good. But what I found on the YouTube one is, and this is very pleasant surprise, I can listen to the audio from any video on YouTube without streaming the video. Okay. So if I want to listen to live versions of songs that are on YouTube or covers right. or Kieran stuff that isn't on like Distro Kid or anything, you know, like his videos, yeah. his vocal covers, for example, so I can put them on, which is pretty cool. Mm. And they've got a decent collection of audio on it too, in terms of albums and right. uh, actual stream content. So it's not bad. Um, Ten or a month, it still feels a bit hefty, but we'll, we'll feel it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and but therein is the problem, isn't it? Ten or a month for access to all of the music that you could ever want. And we're like, it's a bit hefty. <laughs> <laughs> and we just need to go back to that mindset oh. of it's just not it's, it's it's not you're right you're absolutely right music is like it, specifically for you and i it's just something that runs for our veins like it's it yep. keeps us functioning um and even when i fall out of love with music i'm still in love with music yeah i just i just don't remember it at the time and i'm sure you're the same when you're yeah. totally scunnered you don't want to play guitar something comes on and you hear it and you go i'm tapping my foot that's pretty good. I like that melody. And then you, you start listening and before you know it, you're like, I'm going to pick the guitar up and work out those chords. Yep. It just it just happens. Even when you hate your playing, yep. you always find yourself back on it. So uh, At least it happens for me. Yeah. I think um I think that's all we've got to talk about. But I've got it just occurred to me we had some um we had some feedback on the last uh, episode. And I wanted to bring right. it up because it leads quite nicely into the Ormsby plug at the end of the show. Um nice. do, do you know what it is I'm gonna bring up here? I don't. Okay. So we got called out for being hypocrites on the last episode uh, because we oh were no, talking about that's right. Guitar Center going yes. out of business and talking about, and you specifically said, you know, who would want to buy a guitar that they couldn't go in and go in and play? And then somebody I'm rightfully pointed that. out that, well, hang on a minute, you guys advertise for Ormsby guitars who don't stock in stores and that you order and play without uh, without ever playing. Now, I just want to... Well- I, I responded to the guy and I just want to say ultimately this is something you want to take up with Mike more so than me because that's not yep. a position I take almost every guitar that I own has been something I've ordered direct from from the manufacturer I'm more than mm-hmm. happy to play guitars that, that I haven't you know laid my hands on beforehand um, but I thought it would be something that you might want to might want to address for anyone on the spot that's like right. that <laughs> I did reply I'm just trying to um, find what I wrote um, but totally 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 fair comment absolutely happy with that um i did buy my arms based site unseen and I, I i tried to clarify my comments it was phil cross i've just brought the comment sure. up here so i'll read that out and i'll read what i replied sure. and we'll go for there right um and I, I hope my reply doesn't come across as me being an arse or weird because when you read these comments but you try your hardest to write them in the nicest most sincere sure, way sure. and sometimes it comes across as like condescending so yeah. anyway so Phil wrote, and thanks again, Phil. Thanks for listening in the first part, even watching and listening and having enough uh, interest in what us two relatively unknown and unimportant people have to say on any subject matter. Sure, sure. Um, I genuinely really enjoy this channel, but do have a slight problem with one point made. I agree that it's awful that high street guitar shops are looking in jeopardy. Nothing beats walking into a shop, trying a few guitars and coming away with the one that feels right. 
Mike said he doesn't get why anyone would want to buy a guitar without touching and feeling, etc. Yet you both ordered Ormsby guitars online, and the very essence of that company is internet based sales. Absolutely bang on. They do stock them in places, not at, uh, not as much as other uh, bigger you can brands get them that in they compete guitar, with. Guitar, right? uh, they did have them, yeah. but the UK distributor got uh, had, had problems and have changed distributor since right. then. So I think you'll see them more so again in UK stores, but they're pretty busy through Europe. Yeah. America's got some dealers. Sure. Australia's obviously got dealers. So they are in shops. It's yeah. just with it being quite... I don't want to say the brand's in its infancy, but certainly the uh, factory produced side of it. Yeah. The production runs are still pretty young. So they, they are in shops. You can go and play them. And I'll just read the comments again because I'm addressing everything I was going to say anyway. Sure. Right? So you replied right away basically saying, that's an issue with Mike, not me. <laughs> I got all my guitars direct from the builder. Yeah. Just... <laughs> Fair. So, I mean, I did as well. I was lucky enough that when I got my first Ormsby, it came from HQ yeah. because I had been speaking with them about an endorsement and they sure. were like, cool, we'll be interested in working with you. So I got very lucky. But again, doesn't really address what Phil was saying. So I'll read the rest of the comments so we can get through that. So Phil replied to you saying, haha, I just thought, hmm, that's a strange comment. I've actually tried them before at guitar shows, etc. And they're cool. Not my bag because I just love tellies, but they're definitely cool and, we'll put, and well put together. I was wondering if you guys had played them before you spec and bought them. So I kind of missed that comment when I replied. I just replied to the original comment. So I said back to Phil, totally for your comment, which it is. I am a big enough and ugly enough boy slash man to take it in the chin when I say something that could be taken the wrong way, which it was my fault. Totally fair. Totally fair. I did get the guitar before I had played that specific guitar. Yeah. Totally fair. I guess it would have been much more clear to a uh, much more clear point to make if I'd said give the brand slash model you're interested in as much due diligence as possible before ordering. Which is kind of what I meant. I, I haven't ever ordered a guitar. No, I tell you, I have ordered a few guitars that I hadn't played, but I had done my research in terms of does this fit what I usually like in a guitar or sure. am I buying it because I want to try something different um, one example where I bought something I thought I would really like and I fucking hated was when I bought a BC Rich Chuck Schultner at Schultner, Stealth yeah. and it was uh, physically it was minted like uh, the, the idea of it the concept an X shaped guitar with the X2 end the bridge ebony fingerboard reverse uh, headstock cool as fuck just one pickup volume knob that's all you need I got the guitar and it was a piece of shit. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it probably suited other people. There was probably guys that would love it and it being the Chuck Schuldner one, if you're a massive fan of death, which I kind of was at the time, um, would be right up your street. But the guitar just wasn't for me. Hmm. Now, first of all, it turned up just wrapped in bubble wrap and bin bags. <laughs> yep, to the shape of the guitar, somehow with no dings, <laughs> somehow with no damage, right? Which was fucking miraculous. Yeah. It was not an obvious what this guitar was. And there was no reinforcement, by the way. I'm talking literally just bubble wrap, bin bag, <laughs> bubble wrap, bin bag. Right? So it was the shape of the guitar. Um, but the neck profile felt horrible. It had incredible neck dive. It didn't sit well. The pickup sounded shit. The bridge was terrible. The intonation didn't really go well on it. Just everything about it was like, oh, this just isn't for me. And I was disappointed because I really wanted to like the guitar. So that's kind of where my sentiment comes from and where I've learned that lesson myself. Yeah. But again, Phil, what you said is totally fair. So just to follow on what I was saying to him, as Guitar Guitar had Ormsby's in, and I tried the TX7 before I bought mine. But as I've said before, and I know I love Ormsby, and I'm almost at, at the corporate shell level, I followed and knew about Pez and Co way before the GTX models were even conceptualised, I believe, uh, and had spoken to Perry Online a few times on the Ultimate Guitar forums. And I'm talking about back when I was about 13, 14, 15, when I was just getting into guitar. Um, So that would have been between 17 and 15 years ago. Yeah quite a long time ago um perry was very active in the boards i know I've, I've mentioned it before and i was very lucky that a couple of times he commented on things back after i'd asked him questions about the things he was doing in the custom shop etc um and even to the point where i was considering building my own guitar i never got to it because i am useless but i had the idea and i wanted to you love starting um, wee projects mike <laughs> i started them exactly uh <laughs> And that, so I continued on that sort of saying, so really, I had made a really calculated risk in getting mines, and I think it would have been better for me to explain it that way. Hmm. So totally fair comment, uh, Phil. And anyone within the UK that's interested in buying an Ormsby but doesn't have easy access, I'll happily meet you if I'm in your area, either currently or when, slash more like if, 
given this year's track record, I'm out gigging or touring, <laughs> which is yeah. true. I would love to meet up with people and here, have a, put that in your hands, man. Enjoy yeah. it. If you like it, cool, brilliant. If you don't, totally fine. At least that way you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm I'll, sure you've... I'll throw some additional uh-huh. comments in this, right? So, um, like... You you have that kind of nostalgia for the old guitar shop thing, and like I'm very much an online guy. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm I'm all right with these. I think the the difference between context. the the Ormsby and or, or the, why I feel this is a lot more acceptable with something like an Ormsby is you talk about doing your due diligence and doing your research, right? There is a big yes. big fucking difference between you ordering an Ormsby online and you ordering a TTM, you know, because you can get all of the information that you need about an Ormsby. You can do your research. People can show you videos of their guitars, tell you they love their guitars. You can listen real. to people. Yeah, you can listen to people telling you that they have one, but they didn't like it, and they can explain to you why they didn't like it, etc. That's a yeah. lot, lot more than you can get from something like TTM. There, if you know, I would call somebody an idiot for buying a TTM, and I did, um, but I wouldn't call you an idiot for buying an Ormsby because you you have almost no reason to expect something to go wrong if you were to order in something like an Ormsby. I've, you know, I've got... Uh, also worth pointing out that in terms of the the two guitars that we use for promo stuff on this show, we didn't order those, we didn't pay for those. Those were those were gifts as part of our deal with Ormsby. So um, yep. that, that kind of um, disclosure, I think, is important because yes. there's also a lot less worry going into it when i was talking through that guitar with perry because ultimately i wasn't standing to lose a lot and if it turned up and it was garbage i'd say sorry man this guitar i'm really not comfortable promoting promoting the guitars based on the quality of this this guitar so that would that would obviously make it a lot easier for us to make a decision like that as well Um, of course of course so maybe that's a better context to add in as well um i don't think we've ever formally spoke about like how lucky we were certainly in my mind in terms of the sponsorship uh, of the podcast I've already got a pretty good relationship or had a pretty good relationship with the brand and Perry specifically and the and our guys. Um and obviously through the podcast, having a conversation with Perry, etc., we, we fostered that to be part of this as well. And obviously we, we, we pitched that well, we'd love to a sponsorship, we'd love to work in partnership with you. And you said yourself, like, well, what's more of a resounding endorsement of the product than us having the product in our hands and be able to give you an honest answer? Like, I think that is a a, a good uh, thing to make clear mm. to people that are listening or watching. And so I think you're bang on. I um for full disclosure as well. Like, they're not perfect guitars, but I don't think there ever is a perfect guitar. Sure. But I love mine. Yeah. All three of them. You love your seven string. That's great. Fucking Red Dead Goliath. <laughs> it's so I, every time I come around, you're playing it. <laughs> the fact that you would do your Brent Mason cover on it, I think, speaks volumes. Yeah. Uh, and. It doesn't mean I don't love other brands. It doesn't mean that I sure. necessarily prioritize Orms over other brands, but that's just my own preference in terms of what I like to play at the moment. Yeah. And so. I've always wanted to say, you know, to my audience, um, I do have endorsement deals with companies. You know, you'll still mm-hmm. see me listed on Vigier's website. Um, my my beautiful Ruby weapon is just over there. She's still my favorite guitar. I love it a bit because I have a long emotional history of that guitar. Um, but I have a great working relationship with Mayonnaise guitars. I've got a Mayonnaise on order at the moment. I have a great working mm-hmm. relationship with Ormsby guitars. So when we are recommended Ormsby guitars, you have to know, it's really fucking important to know that I'm not recommending for any reason than I like them. I won't play things that I don't like. Despite the fact I have working relationships with all of these companies, I have no working relationship with Fender whatsoever, and I play that Fender on my channel more than anything else. Because again, I will play the things that I like. I will pl- I will not keep guitars around that I don't think are good. So yeah, mm-hmm. the obviously thing worked I- out I've for me. I've seen you get rid of guitars that you do really like, but they're just not your preference to what like, compared to other stuff you've got, like yeah. the John Five Telecaster yeah. you had. It was a great guitar, played great, sounded great, solid built, but it was just like well, it's surplus to requirements because of as for you, you've, you've got your butterscotch telly and a whole number of other tellies as yeah. well <laughs> so you've got the go-to and alternatives yeah <laughs> and it was like well oh well yeah somebody else can enjoy it's it. silly for it to just sit in my loft <laughs> yeah I- i'm glad you brought that up and i'm glad we spoke about it because i wouldn't want it to feel or anyone to think there is any sort of conflict of interest sure. in this we're not being told we have to say the guitars are great and i think perry would probably be i think he would die embarrassment if we decided we were just going to shill yeah <laughs> and i don't think that's his style either yeah um you are very big in integrity, and I think that's why you and I are such close friends, because I think we're both in the same wavelength of just tell the truth. It doesn't matter if it hurts. It's certainly better than talking shit and not 
being true to yourself or your actual opinions and feelings yep. and thoughts and stuff. Um, and I really value that in yourself and it's part of your friendship as well because you and I talk candidly about things quite a lot. Yep. There's been a couple of times you've said things to me or I've said to you and it's it could have been, it could have went bad or it could have went good sure, but sure. knowing each other quite well, it's yep. always been, I'd rather take the stark honesty than yep. be lied to and then sort of changes. Yep. So, yeah, that's good. And in anyway. terms of uh, a comment to Phil, or not really a comment to Phil, but a more comment to the to the people that will be listening now, like f- what Phil did there was levied a, a very serious, ac- not an accusation, but a, a point that was well worth discussing, pointing out what he perceived to be hypocrisy and may, is very welcome to continue perceiving us that way. Um, yes. But we want that from you guys. Like we are not beyond question. Like challenge us always fucking challenge us we're always gonna yes. always gonna read it and especially this like this just popped into my mind while i was talking to mike because i was like that was actually a really interesting comment um and i thought it'd be interesting to talk about that one challenge us guys if you think that we've said something that's incorrect or we disagree with us vehemently on something tell us love it we just love it like this entire thing is about discussion and having a, having good conversations and like you, you anyone that listens to this show knows that me and mike do not agree on everything um, we vehemently disagree on a lot of things, but that still works. You know, that's that's enjoyable. It's nice that you can in, enjoy it. Just don't take it to the yes. grave. <laughs> don't walk away from the person and be like, I can't believe, I can't believe he doesn't agree with me on that thing. Like, Well, I mean, yeah. one of the first conversations you and I ever had was me berating you that you didn't like Buckethead. So... <laughs> I thought we weren't going to be friends. Oh, no. I thought it was just like, I'm going to rip this guy's nut in the pub. I'm you... just going to harass him. And I mean, we just been like, it's just not for me. And I'd be like, what do you mean it's not for you? <laughs> it released like 12 albums in like three months. He's, he's amazing. You're just like, it's not another Mac yeah. yeah, to some people that's a selling point. And to me, that's a reason to avoid. <laughs> I actually thought from that interaction, it being in the pub, me being half cut, like I've made a dick of myself. This guy's going to become an absolute fanny. <laughs> and somehow you and I ended up best mates. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've, you've, just, you've given me the fear because I've got. I know uh, I woke up to my emails today and someone's paid me for a buckethead transcription. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> I'll do it if you want. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> in fact, I'll tell you what it is. See if you can tell me. See if you can tell me what I'm in for. I've not. Uh, right. Because someone like my long clients that I've worked with for a very long time, they will. Uh, yeah. They'll just send me things and they know how much things cost. Um. Oh, okay. It's so from, just like I uh, get get that done and I'll, I'll square you up whatever will you can i yeah that's good that's uh, okay cool. it's from it's from the young bucket a dvd uh final chapter of the young bucket a dvd so probably nothing thankfully it's not a song apparently i'm hoping it's him right. playing halloween that one I'm, I'm putting it on screen people so people people can see it that's when he taps the root notes into it. the bass notes even it's not the halloween thing oh please don't be shred You'll be able to work oh, out terrible. really quickly because Buckethead, as as much as I love him and he's really creative, he's also quite formulaic. Yeah, like if he, he follows a lot of chord progressions. Uh, sorry, the, uh, probably a better way to put it is like Buckethead's got yin and yang when it yeah. comes to music. There is a song that's going to have verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and maybe a modulation or a bridge of some kind. Yeah, and then there's the ones that are absolute nonsense, atonally shredding <laughs> their weird noises and talking through a fucking puppet mask, pretending he's. Uh, a, a corpse and just being yep. buckethead so <laughs> aye you'll have fun with that sweet so on the note of Ormsby again just so you guys are fully aware this show has been brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars if you have the time please do head on over and follow them on Instagram to see more of their incredible work I'm actually spending more and more of my time each day scrolling through Instagram and really getting the appeal of looking at incredible instruments like this it just makes you want to order something really really special of course you can always contact them if you want to order a custom shop guitar or head on over to their website check out the pre-order section and get involved on the upcoming Goliath Run 14. Again, one of these guitars can be pre-ordered for as little as 1200 US dollars. That's an incredible price. That's a lot of guitar for very little money. So if you want something like this in your life, head on over to ormsbyguitars.com and get involved. Thanks so much to Ormsby and we'll see you for another show soon. Laters. So as always, a huge thank you to our friends and family over at Ormsby Guitars. You guys absolutely rock. Go and check them out. Follow them on Instagram, Facebook, all of that good stuff. Let them know we sent you. And uh, as always, if you do end up buying a guitar, do let us know. We love seeing pictures of the guitars that you buy. Send them. Doesn't to even us need on. to be an Ormsby. Just just share the pawn with us. That is worth pointing out. I 
I'm happy to see your Ormsby's and see that we've uh, helped helped Ormsby make sales. That's great. But yep. also, if you buy any new guitars, let us know. Send us pictures. We thoroughly any, enjoy it. <laughs> any new gear at all, anything you think we'd be interested in. Yeah. We've got a lot of friends of the show that we don't necessarily have uh, profession, uh, professional affiliations with. Rev, for example. Doesn't mean we don't love them. Doesn't mean we don't want to promote them and help them out and see them doing well and see people getting into their stuff. Absolutely. So, um, in fact... Here's something that I never, never told you. Uh, I bumped into Kendall the other day, oh, and okay. he told me that he had a Rev G3 for a bit, and he okay. said he really enjoyed it, ah. which is cool. You know what I mean? It's kind of small world. I think he either he'd seen you had one or I had one, and he'd meant. I think he went and got one, and he was also talking about getting a G4. Yeah. So, eh, there you go. They, they're good small pedals. World. They very are. Very just, much are. I've had a panic. I'm looking at my pedal board. And it's not on it. It was on top of my amp. <laughs> I was like, fuck, where's it gone? <laughs> no, it's run away. I just don't Actually, use my dirt pedals. I just, I just play clean nowadays. <laughs> yeah, because you're getting old. I know. I'm so old. I'm 32 now, mate. Like, time is Boom. time is wasting away. Someone said to me, you're not that old, Levi. Melissa was saying, you're not that old. And I was like, Melissa, I'm middle-aged. She was like, what do you mean you're middle-aged? And I was like, look, if, if by some miracle I live to the age of 90, if by some miracle I live to the age of ninety, I'm in the middle third of my life. Well, it, it's funny you're talking about that. I had a bit of disagreement with a family member who said that I was just a boy, and funnily enough, it was over politics, right? But no, it's fine. It's totally cool. It was a uh, prod in the bear, and it, you know, family members can obviously go off on each other quite easily. Yeah. And uh, I remember thinking about that comment, and it, it didn't rile me so much that it was infantilizing, but it riled me because I was like, you're probably fucking right, because I'm pretty sure the average life expectancy in where we stay is probably 60. So, like, a, a middle-aged, you'd call me a boy, I would consider myself a man. Yeah, oh, 100%. Like, uh, I think the only thing that comes with age beyond our years is arrogance. And and a sense of entitlement that your opinion must be worth more because if you reach our age and you're not your opinion isn't completely equal to someone uh, ten twenty years older than you, then there's something majorly wrong with the your ability to have engaged with the fucking world. You know what I mean? Like I do know people that I would value their opinion considerably less, and it's not because I disagree with them on things. It's because you know that they take no interest in in the world outside of their immediate you know day-to-day -day life people like that uh, don't matter to me so much but yeah if people you take an interest about... in things that happen in the world and and mm -hmm. you have an opinion on then it's a it's a fair and valid opinion i'd, I'd never yeah. be shouted out as you're just a boy Fuck no off. no it, it, don't be daft it, like it, it it was almost as if it was serious but i think it was just my tact versus another person that i'd never really had that kind of conversation with button heads um and as you know i'm fairly stubborn <laughs> and that that doesn't come from the ground i get that from family members sure and the member of my family that i was talking with is probably the most not the most stubborn sorry but probably the strongest character it's probably yeah. the best way to put it um yeah so everyone's all right like i've not fallen out or anything but it was a very interesting conversation yeah. um i i think you're, you you could be right as well when you're talking about when you get to our age and above you become more arrogant in your opinion and your beliefs because well you've got the tenure behind you to say well i know what i'm talking about because it's been proven through what i've reflected if sure. they are that critical yeah it's a funny one and a strange one because i hated it when i was young being talked down to with people that are older than me but it's an inevitability that you just reach an age where if if a 15 year old is trying to argue with you about about how the music business should work or the ethics behind what someone's done I can't mm -hmm. help myself but just write it off as come back to me when you've got a little bit more fucking experience of how the world actually works. <laughs> so we all become that person. I think it's yeah. just important to make sure that there's some sort of cut off. When you're speaking to someone who's 30 years of age, right, they're not a wee fucking boy anymore. <laughs> I know. But again, it's all right saying that until you've got the the, uh, the rose tinted glasses of family members that still see you as children you're, yeah. you'll always be a wee boy to them whatever yeah good point um, <laughs> aye uh, it's interesting I, it depends entirely on the topic as well sure but anyway you and I let's try and get episodes down to an hour we're now at an hour and 34 minutes or so so okay. I'm sure these good people don't want to listen to us talking shit about me arguing with family members well Maybe they do. I'm going to go one bit further than that and say I think this is our best episode in a while so we'll, oh, let, the, we'll let the audience um, they can tell us what they think of it in the description below <laughs> as always please do buy a t-shirt check out Ormsby all of that good stuff any closing messages for people Mike? 
yes absolutely thanks once again for all your support and care and comments um sorry i forgot to reply to that comment and bring it up publicly it's not out of ignorance it's just because i am a fucking idiot also you responded to it you know <laughs> you no no but it's it, good so. to i think it's much more uh, engaging as you're saying for us to take these comments and talk about them i'd really like to do a live stream where we take comments and we get to like just chat we through shit with people so maybe we can set that up yeah. um i know you also said you'd worked out a way for us to do album club together as well which is yeah. going to be fucking banging yeah i can do live streams now here using two microphones so nice fucking nice i mean right, it's, it's very good. easy we're just doing them in stereo and i'm on the right channel you're on the left channel <laughs> Just but, you know, I'm great with technology, so I've learned how to do that now. <laughs> Hacker man. Mike. S- yes. Until next time. He's going to make me angry. I can see it. He's, I can see the rage. It's building up in me. But you were trying to close me off before I've even got the chance to recommend my album. Oh, oh did, so, yeah, you didn't do that. Go on. Give, me the, give us the, the album recommendation. God's sake, Levi. I'm not telling you. Know. It's Sordid Pink is the name of the project. And the album only came out this year. And the album, I believe, is called Sordid Pink as well. It is a... It's a pop rock album. Okay. But the guitars are very gentle, very heavy, cool solos. Nice guitar tones. And it was Kieran that recommended this, funnily enough. What I didn't know until yesterday is actually it's David, Max and Mitch expand. It was a project they had yeah. for years. Yeah. And they've been sitting in the album for a long time. Yeah, as soon as you said so that I'd, name, I was like, I know who that is. Why do I not know I, who that is? And as soon as you said that, I'm like, yep, there we go. Well, there you go. So this album is fucking tremendous. Might not be your cup of first or second listen, but I've had it on all week solid. Really, really enjoying it. Yep. Had it on, Nancy was really enjoying it because it's like, it's an easy to listen album. It's not got any crazy chord progressions or mad guitar stuff that's like, totally throws off the wall, but it's inventive enough that it, ca- it really catches you, yeah. which I know David, Max and Mitch is really good at doing yep. having hooks and melodies and stuff ah, um, but it's a great wee album go and give it a listen it only came out this year i think it's fucking tremendous i think the vocals are not ridiculous in some of the songs um i go and enjoy it and i suppose we, we can have a closing message now if you really want until next time i love you all be safe be good and fuck levi go fuck yourself <laughs>